Workplace cooperation, important but difficult. So why do I think cooperation is important? Well, it's because the employment relationship is unequal and a balance is best. So this picture is very useful for capturing um, the way pluralist and industrial relations scholars and others think about the employment relationship, um, how it's seen as a bargaining problem between workers and organizations that have, yes, maybe some interests in common, but also some interests that are in conflict. And organizations and workers have different levels of bargaining power. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a tension there as each side tries to get a better deal for itself. Um, now, this picture can also um, be used to capture, uh, you know, some nice clever imagery about uh, the importance of balance and the danger of being out of balance. If we focus over here, where capital is portrayed as being excessively strong, we see the pendulum would be po uh, pointing towards despotism. And we have this cornucopia, which is overflowing with weapons of despots, like... Um, uh, handcuffs and uh, collars and whips and chains and things of that nature. Um, but on the other extreme, when labor is portrayed as being excessively strong, and it's an equally um, undesirable situation. This one is characterized as anarchy, and we have um, a cornucopia there of imagery associated with anarchism. So there is um, a skull, dagger, dynamite, things of that nature. And so when labor is excessively strong or capital is excessively strong, both are portrayed as um, poor outcomes for society. And instead, right, society is best off here in the middle where there's some semblance of balance between labor and management. And so here when the pendulum is somewhat in the middle, it's portrayed as um, a bountiful harvest. You can see squash and corn and wheat and things of that nature. And again, this picture reflects a pluralist industrial relations conceptualization of the employment relationship where labor and management are bargaining with each other and society is best off when there is a balance. Think about this balance um, in terms of being a balance of rights, for example, a managerial prerogative and being balanced with workers' rights, or we can think of it as a, a balance of um, efficiency, equity, and voice. Efficiency typically being seen as more sort of the organizational objective, profit, efficient allocace, allocation of scarce resources, etc. Equity and voice being what workers want, equity being fairness and non-discrimination and security, voice being some kind of uh, input into decision making. And so if um, management is dominating, then efficiency might override equity and voice. And so instead, we're looking for a balance of efficiency, equity, and voice. And so what does this have to do with cooperation? Well, there's a lot of synergies between a balanced employment relationship and a workplace characterized by high degrees of cooperation. And in fact, I would argue that one of the best ways to achieve a balanced employment relationship is through a highly cooperative workplace. When you have a highly cooperative workplace in a deep way rather than a superficial way, it's likely that that's a case where the employment relationship is balanced. And again, there's lots of synergies, lots of shared principles between balanced employment relationships and workplace uh, cooperation. Um, there's respect for the other side's interests and seeing the other side's interests as um, legitimate and worthy of pursuit as opposed to you just trying to win more and more for your side at the expense of the other side. Um, there's also shared perspectives on conflict and conflict isn't seen as necessarily a bad thing. You want to figure out how to deal with it productively but it's not something to just be swept under the rug or to be assumed to be uh, dysfunctional. Um, also in thinking about balanced employment relationships as well as cooperative workplaces, right? there should be mindsets where you're not looking to dominate the other side. Again, cooperative relationships, balanced relationships, neither side would be dominating. Um, and so the importance of workplace cooperation in practice, in my mind, is really rooted in the 
conceptual and theoretical and normative importance of having balanced employment relationships. And so that's what links the two together. And to me, that's uh, the genesis or important genesis for the importance of workplace cooperation. Okay, but how to achieve workplace cooperation, right? It's very difficult. Um, and I want to quickly highlight um, some sort of ideational reasons why achieving cooperation is difficult as well as some structural or resource uh, reasons why it is difficult. First, we can recognize that trying to achieve cooperative workplaces is a very long-standing issue. Um, there are records that survive that a Roman farmer Columella wrote down over 2,000 years ago about his agricultural practices. Some of the records that survive pertain to his management or HR practices. Um, and this includes um, the fact that Columella made it a practice to consult with his slaves because he thought that the slaves were willing to work on something um, in a more willing way if the slaves thought their opinions had been solicited and their advice followed, right? This, think about this as trying to create cooperation. Or is it, right? This highlights that this is an ongoing issue, lots of different strategies, um, lots of different challenges. But this particular quote should also be thinking a little more critically and, well, is this even cooperation, right? If people are sort of being tricked or fooled into think that their opinions matter or that they have some, uh, some, uh, autonomy or some power when they really don't, is that really true cooperation? And so that quickly surfaces issues about well, what do we even mean by cooperation? And um, it's very easy to say cooperation. Policymakers talk about cooperation. Um, uh, managers, executives talk about cooperation, but what really is it? Um, and so we really need to dig in and, and think about alternative meetings of cooperation. And to do that, it's useful to think about different perspectives on the employment relationship, different frames of reference. A frame of reference on the employment relationship is simply a lens or a mental model through which people see the employment relationship. And it's the, the lens through which you then interpret um, things like unions or HR policies or workplace cooperation. And so there's a Four different frames of reference I think are particularly instructive. We can have more of a market-based model where we see the employment relationship as just characterized by self-interested workers, self-interested -orga self organizations contracting with each other. When it's in their self-interest to contract with each other, they will. When a worker finds a better deal, they'll quit. When the organization finds a worker who will do a better job or do it more cheaply or whatever, um, they'll fire the worker, right? So just very atomistic individual agents um, contracting in the market. High road human resource management is rooted in a unitarist frame of reference as opposed to a neoliberal or free market approach. A unitarist um, label comes from emphasizing a unity of interest, shared interest between labor and management, between workers and their organizations. And so the emphasis here is, in fi is finding managerial policies, HR policies that align the interests of employers and employees. So selecting the right employees, paying them well, um, training them, giving them uh, voice mechanisms so that they'll be more engaged, but also more productive, right? So you have this very win-win situation, emphasizes um, shared interests and interest alignment over conflict. When it comes to thinking about cooperation, it's useful to distinguish within the unitarist school between two sort of very broad approaches, right? This could be done in sort of a hierarchical fashion. HR is just deciding what it thinks the appropriate policies are, um, very much again in the, in the name of interest alignment, but not with a lot of consultation, or there could be more of a consultative variant. Uh, third, key frame of reference on the employment relationship is called pluralism. Pluralist industrial relations is the one captured by the um, capital, uh, capitalist and laborer bargaining, pushing the pendulum at the beginning of this presentation. Right? Think of this as two sides that have unequal bargaining power, and so they're sort of struggling with each other to get the upper hand, get a better deal for themselves. Um, so there's their conditions aren't being perfectly mediated by perfectly competitive markets. There's a bargaining 
power problem going on here. Um, and as part of that, they have some interests in common, like in the uh, Unitrust frame of reference, but unlike the Unitrust frame of reference, where it's really emphasizing the interest alignment and shared interest, pluralist schools of thought fully embrace the fact that, or the assumption that there are some interests that labor and organizations have in conflict with each other rather than in common. So um, both sides want sustainable, profitable organizations that will continue to return uh, profits to shareholders as well as keep workers employed in good jobs. But at the same time, right, shareholders, managers, owners of a business want to shade, might want to uh, shade a little bit more towards higher profits. Workers have their own interests in terms of better wages, better benefits, right? So there might be things, interests that are in conflict as well. But the key here for pluralism, this is where the pluralist label comes from, is that there are a plurality of interests, a multiplicity of interests, and by characterizing them as a plurality of interests, we're recognizing the legitimacy of all of those interests. So increased profits as well as increased wages are both legitimate objectives. If we think of a classic pluralist case as um, workers represented by a union engaging in collective bargaining, right, we can easily think of sort of more adversarial approaches, hard bargaining, looking out for your own interests. You're not trying to uh, get rid of the union or put the firm out of business, but it's very much about advocating for your own interests. Um, or there can be a more collaborative variant um, within the pluralist model as well. And then lastly, the fourth key frame of reference is more a set of uh, critical schools of thought, radical schools of thought. Now we've gone further down on the scale in terms of emphasizing conflicts rather than shared interests. Um, and these schools of thought, whether it be descended from Marxism or critical race theory or feminist schools of thought, right, all of those have differing um, structural classes that have sharply antagonistic um, conflicts of interest with uh, a dominant group, whether it be capital or men or um, Caucasian, whatever the case may be. Um, and so this, these schools of thought really emphasize these deep-seated structural conflicts of interest. And then all of these frames of reference have perspectives on cooperation but it's really only the consultative variant of unitarism and the collaborative variant of pluralism that um, we should really see as embracing cooperation in a deep, meaningful way rather than just a, a superficial way. And so let's think about that um, a little bit more. All of these different perspectives, so I've taken the four frames of reference and the, the two unitarist variants and the two pluralist variants from the previous slide. Um, and talk, this slide here is intended to try to briefly capture what cooperation means in each of these different frames of reference. Right? In a market-based perspective, cooperation is just living up to your uh, side of the bargain, what you seeing through, fulfilling what you promised you were going to do in this employment relationship. Now that's important, but it's really sort of a very superficial uh, perception or definition of cooperation. Autocratic unitarism, you know, those managers might talk about cooperation, want employees to uh, exhibit higher levels of cooperation, but really this means compliance and they want workers simply to be compliant with managerial directives. Again, a very superficial perspective on cooperation. If we jump down to uh, the very bottom, the critical perspective, this is typically very uh, skeptical of rhetoric around cooperation and really sees it sort of as disguised or manufactured, um, really sort of more of an HR strategy to uh, fool workers, if you will, um, into thinking that their interests are being looked at, looked, looked after with, um, by managers. Um, and it's, it's really just a way to increase uh, organizational power at the expense of workers. Um, so it's really a, a skeptical, critical view of cooperation, partnership sometimes. Um, it's really just the, the two middle uh, rows here, consultative unitarism and collaborative pluralism. Those are really the only two frames of reference that embrace cooperation in the workplace in a meaningful, deep way 
that involves really working together, respecting the other side's objectives as legitimate, trying to factor that into decision making and making sure that one side isn't always dominating the other. And again, we can see this with a, a unitarist variant um, where the workers probably aren't represented by a union, um, but workers are deeply engaged and their interests are respected and, um, and uh, you know, fully pulled into uh, decisions that are being made. With a pluralist model, there's probably more likely to be formal structures of representation for employees. Again, classic case being the employees being unionized. And so it's not only the employees, but also their representatives, their union, that are working together with management on mutual goals that can serve all of those parties' interests. Okay, to think about these different types or different perspectives on cooperation, different degrees of cooperation, um, my co-authors and I, Mark Bray, Joanna McNeil, and myself, in an article that we published earlier this year in the British Journal of Industrial Relations, we created this chart where on the vertical axis we have degrees of cooperation, nothing too sophisticated here, just sort of this loose scale, low to high degrees of cooperation. And then on the bottom, think about a worker and a manager, or a set of workers and the organization. Think about how much in the workplace they're thinking about their own individual distinct interests, just workers thinking about worker interests, managers thinking about organizational interests, or think about the extent to which they're also um, respecting and thinking about the other side's interests. And so with it, while they're thinking about the other side's interests, that's here in the middle where we're labeling more of a mutual focus on interest. And to either side of the end of the scale here, it's organizations, managers, or workers, unions, just thinking about their own, own interests separately as distinct from the others. And it's here in the middle where we have a mutual focus on interests, so respecting the other side's interests. Um, that's where we have a high degree of cooperation. You have a situation of mutual gains, working together to create situations that benefit everybody. Maybe not everybody equally every single time, but over time, you don't have one side dominating. And again, as I've described, you can have a pluralist version of this, you can have a unitarist version of this. Um, but we think there's more going on here, and it's, it's useful to think of this as a curve because as we go out from the middle and we're leaving the area of mutual focus on interest and becoming more and more separate, more and more self-focused in the interests that we're focusing on as an actor in the employment relationship, well, then the degree of cooperation is also going to decline. And so we have what we call a cooperation curve which again, as you get more focused on a distinct uh, selfish focus on interest, you're going to necessarily have lower degrees of cooperation. And so as you get sort of further away from the middle, right, collaborative pluralism can start to become adversarial pluralism as you focus more and more on your own interests, whether that be on the worker side or the organizational side, consultative unitarism, um, as the consultation part starts to wane, as managers maybe start to make some more decisions on their own, right? that starts to become autocratic unitarism. And then if we go further apart, even less cooperation, um, we end up in with more sort of radical views of cooperation or more uh, sort of market-based, egoist, neoliberal perspectives on cooperation, which again are fairly sort of superficial over there. And we think this curve idea um, is a very useful reminder that nobody reaches a truly cooperative uh, workplace situation, a mu situation of mutual gains um, by accident, right? You have to be very intentional. It takes a lot of work. Um, you need shared meaning. You need common purpose. You need the right skills you need a lot of attention to this. So it's very intentional to, to get to that pinnacle there. Um, but this curve, right, so, so it's hard work. You don't just get there by accident. You actually have to work to get, um, to follow this cooperative path, if you will. Um, but this curve is also meant to remind you that it's easy to fall down. Um, as I've already described, right, a bargaining situation which is collaborative, 
well, maybe executives or maybe union rank and file members, right? They want their representatives to be a little more aggressive in representing their own self-interest. And so collaborative pluralism starts to become a little more adversarial, right? It's easy to start sliding down the curve. I've already mentioned how um, managers start making some more decisions unilaterally, not involving uh, workers as much in terms of consultative processes, right? You start to drift away and fall down from consultative unitrism into autocratic unitrism. So the, the shape of this curve here is very intentional to capture what we call entropy or sort of this degradation process where it's easy to sort of start slipping into focusing on your own interests, your own decision-making processes, um, and that can erode the cooperative process and the degree of cooperation. And again, um, that can be either side. It's not always that a union is at fault or an organization is at fault. Um, it can be you know, both sides or either side at fault for this. But hopefully the shape of this curve right, really is meant to reinforce that it takes hard work and a degree of intentionality to reach this mutual gains and to sustain this point of mutual gains. And it's very easy, um, misunderstandings, um, becoming a little more focused on your own interests, miscommunication, all different kinds of things, even just lack of attention, taking it for granted, taking the relationship for granted, you can uh, start to slide down these curves and move away from cooperation. So um, at the risk of sort of making this analogy uh, too explicit and too corny, uh, right here we're on this mountain path. There's this steep slope, which we could easily fall down if we don't pay attention. All right, that's meant to be an analogy here for cooperation. The path there is difficult and staying there is difficult, right? There can be different meanings. It's easy to prioritize your own interest or maybe some constituency, rank and file, top executives, right? They're also pressing um, the workers or the managers engaged in this cooperative process to be a little more aggressive in uh, advocating for their own self-interest. Um, it's also difficult to pursue and maintain cooperation because it requires particular skills around communication and listening and problem solving and conflict resolution. Or maybe outside of the organization, um, there's just adversarial social norms or public policies. We live in divisive times. Um, and uh, some people think that you know labor law or other public policies might support adversarial bargaining rather than cooperative bargaining or information exchange, those types of things. So there might be sort of factors outside of our organization that make cooperation, cooperation different, difficult. Um, so there's a whole host of pitfalls and I don't want this presentation to be overly negative where we focus on these pitfalls, but I think it's important to articulate them and for um, people engaged in workplace cooperation, the pursuit of workplace cooperation, to recognize these different pitfalls so that you can do a better job avoiding them. And notice, right, that it's not just sort of a lack of resources or a lack of structure or things of that nature, right, but it's also some of it is around meetings and ideas and making sure that um, everybody has a common explicit definition of cooperation that people buy into and, and understand. Um, so it's not just about processes or structures or resources or training, but it's also about ideas. Um, it involves some degree of responsibility for the other side's interests, not being completely selfish, and self-interested and focused on your own side. And it involves being very intentional, needing champions of the cooperation process, um, needing resources, needing skills, needing patience, things of that nature. Um, and so again, recognizing the different ideational as well as structural challenges and pitfalls is one important way of um, trying to then confront those head on and do a better job of navigating the cooperation path so that you can achieve the pinnacle of cooperation on the cooperation curve.